I'm Don Scott. I'm the director of sustainability for the National Biodiesel Board. Uh, really, really glad to be here this morning. I'm always glad to talk about biodiesel. I'm particularly honored to and privileged to talk to you know you guys who already know the score and you're converted. I'm preaching to the choir. I know. I've got uh, about 20 minutes worth of slides that I've rehearsed and polished. But we've got a lot of time in that, which is great because that allows us time for for our questions and, and conversations. <laughs> And I really look forward to that. And if you don't speak up, if you don't engage and have a conversation, you're going to have to sit through the extra slides I tacked on to go into economic <laughs> metric modeling and indirect land use change and things that you may not be interested in. So, so pipe up and we'll talk about what you guys are interested in. I'll tell you what I, what I know and what I observe from a, a national perspective when it comes to the biodiesel industry. It was, uh, it was kind, of, kind of discouraging to hear some of your stories about all the poaching that's gone on and all the efforts that you have to do to defend the, the business you develop. There's always somebody out there trying to uh, be a free rider on the system and take advantage of what all the hard work that's gone in before them. And, and, uh, so that's definitely, it's definitely something that's a problem with our industry. I don't think it's just biodiesel. Probably every industry has those growing pains. But biodiesel really is uh, a community. We're a small industry in the, in the big picture. Uh, so we, we really do succeed uh, when, we, when we work together and move forward in the community. So glad this this conference is being put on. Glad I was able to put space. Go forward. I'll just I'll just scroll through them. I think. I've got enough. Okay. No, it doesn't have to be too fancy. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Um, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I know everybody understands why we're here today. I, I wonder, we cover a few of those points. Uh, I highlight the fact that biodiesel is more than a good idea. Biodiesel is really something that we have to do. Something that we have to be uh, successful doing. Maybe I can encourage you that each of you are on the right track and maybe give you a few more arrows in your quiver how to defend and promote your industry. But liquid fuel, it's obvious to say that liquid fuel is an absolute necessity. You know, those of us that think about sustainability a lot, we have to admit that there are consumption habits that need to be scaled back. There are types of energy consumption that need to be converted to other forms of energy. But we're always going to have a need for liquid fuel. We, we depend on liquid fuel for food production, for food distribution. Every aspect of commerce and public safety relies on liquid fuel. So that's a given. We're going to have to have some liquid fuel. And we need alternatives to the liquid fuel that we use now. We need liquid fuels that are renewable. We need liquid fuels that are energy efficient, environmentally friendly. We need liquid fuels that recycle carbon. I've only got one slide on energy security. There's a lot to talk about on this uh, issue alone. But I just wanted to point out a few of the highlights that, that I see that often get neglected when we talk about energy security. We, we know that fossil fuels are running out. We know it's a finite resource. Eventually, we're going to have to switch away from fossil fuels. I think the cost of fossil fuels are going to become unbearable long before we physically run out of fossil fuels. It's important to recognize that you know, we're importing half of the petroleum we use in the U.S. It's actually low right now. It's actually less than 50%. It's still a significant amount. And we do so at a cost approaching a billion dollars every single day. That's, that's $700,000 a minute that, that we're handing over to somebody else. $700,000 a minute that we could be using in our own communities. If we were using domestic fuel instead of importing fuel, that money stays within our borders, could be used to do all sorts of things for, for our society. Beyond just the fact that we cannot, can't afford to keep handing over our money, if we think about where our money is going, the, the, global, the global market for oil is a fixed market. It's controlled by a cartel that would be illegal in, in the U.S. You know, it, was just, it was only yesterday or the day before yesterday I heard people talking on NPR about we need to get rid of subsidies for renewable fuels, we need to let uh, the free market take control and we'll have the cheapest fuels available. Well, there is no free market particularly for liquid fuels. It, it, the game is fixed. And if we pay attention to who's fixing the game, it's a lot of countries and, and regions of the world that have significant differences in their ideology relative to what we have. A lot of the people that we're buying oil from do not have a very good record for protecting the environment or protecting freedom of religion, or protecting civil rights, or equal rights. And so while we give them money, we, we weaken our own country, we, we give them financial support and political leverage to make those regimes stronger. So that, 
significant significant threats to our way of life and the ideals we hold important. So, just some of the reasons why we we need domestic sources of energy so that we're not importing oil. And that's so. I'm not, with that, I'm getting off of my energy security soapbox. I'm moving on to my uh, biogenic carbon soapbox. Um, so we we definitely need. Uh, domestic sources of energy. We need domestic sources of energy that are renewable and recycle carbon. Since the Industrial Revolution, since we learned to harness the, the marvelous power of energy in fossil fuels, in coal and oil and natural gas, you know, we've done tremendous things for society, but we've also been filling the atmosphere with carbon. Just a little bit of, you know, a little bit of background on why we have a greenhouse gas problem, the history of carbon. 200 million years ago, 500 million years ago, the levels of carbon in the atmosphere were much higher than they are today. You know, on the order of 20 times higher than they are today. Life on Earth did not exist until over millions of years, you know, through natural processes, that carbon became sequestered in, in the crust of the Earth. You know, plants take carbon out of the atmosphere and, and, and solidify it in, in plant bodies. Most of that goes back to the atmosphere. Most of that carbon in plants is temporary. It goes back to the atmosphere when they die or when they rot and decay or when they burn. Some of it gets stored temporarily in soils, but even that is, is relatively temporary because the carbon in soils can oxidize and go back to the atmosphere, otherwise be disturbed. It's only through the geologic process that takes you know, a small amount of that and sequesters that carbon underground permanently. So, like I said, it took hundreds of million years to get all that carbon underground. We've been pulling it out of the ground as fast as we can for the last uh, century or, or more. Um, and what the result is we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere. And if we, if we look at the rate of that extraction, if we're looking at just, just the carbon that comes from fossil fuels, not, not carbon that comes from land use disturbance, but just from fossil fuels, we're emitting 7.3 billion tons of fossil carbon every year to the atmosphere. Now the plants, all the trees and, and on Earth are absorbing some of that carbon. They can absorb about 2.2 2 billion tons every year. The oceans are absorbing carbon, uh, almost 2 billion tons. It's making them acidic. It's having <coughs> negative consequences for, for marine life. But nevertheless, the oceans can soak up some of that carbon. But they can't keep up. All of the plants on Earth and all of the oceans on Earth can't keep up with the amount of carbon that we're pulling out of the crust of the Earth and putting in the atmosphere. So to the, to the tune of 3 billion tons a year, we emitted 3 billion tons last year. We're going to emit 3 billion tons this year. We're going to emit 3 billion tons next year and every year after until we find an alternative to liquid fuels that can recycle carbon instead of continuing to take carbon out of permanent storage and, and put it into the atmosphere. So one of the, the fears I have is I think there's some people out there that think that, well, if I plant a tree, that'll, se that'll sequester carbon. If we protect the rainforest, maybe not in my backyard, but if we protect the forest in, in South America or Southeast Asia, that'll, that'll soak up the carbon and we can keep using fossil fuels. And that's an incorrect assumption. Those trees are already busy doing the job they were doing long before we started using fossil fuels. They take carbon out of the atmosphere for sure, but that carbon eventually goes back to the atmosphere as well. So they can't take on the burden that we're putting on them with trying to absorb the, the carbon from fossil fuels. Anybody have any questions? So it's clear, everybody's in agreement. The only way to really get a grip on atmospheric CO2 is we have to stop using fossil fuels, or at least slow down. If we could slow down, that would be something. And so if we look at we need liquid fuels. That's a given. We need an alternative to fossil fuels. There is no other alternative for liquid fuels other than petroleum and biofuels. It's only those two things that we found so far in the, in the universe to make liquid fuels. <coughs> we start to get a little bit more on the bright side now in that we actually do have an opportunity in biofuels. We can, we can harness this natural cycle. Car plants you know, have this natural ability to take solar energy, take carbon out of the atmosphere, incorporate that into oils and sugars, nature's natural way of storing energy for, for easy access. And we can, we can harness some of that for energy. We can harvest some energy out of this natural cycle. And if we do so the right ways, we can do so within this natural cycle of carbon. So instead of adding carbon to the atmosphere, we're taking advantage of this natural system, harnessing some energy that we can use to, 
the power, the things that we think in society are important enough to, to warrant the use of liquid fuels. And we're particularly lucky as we, we represent biodiesel that biodiesel is the best liquid fuel alternative we found. Biofuel is the best biofuel that we found. It has the best greenhouse gas profile. It has the best energy balance. Biodiesel reduces criteria air pollutants. It, it, it cleans up the emissions from the tailpipes of diesel engines and vehicles. Biodiesel reduces impact to water resources. You know, the production of biodiesel relative to petroleum diesel reduces wastewater by 79%, reduces hazardous waste production by 96%. And the reason it's 96% instead of 100% is that that 4% of hazardous waste, that's, you know, that's coming from the petroleum and the lube oils in our tractors and equipment that we use to make biodiesel. So we, we, it's difficult to get completely away from fossil fuels. Can you say those numbers again? Um, reduces hazard, or hazardous waste production by 96% and reduces wastewater production by 79%. And those numbers are from the, this is an older life cycle of the study, but from the 1998 study by uh, National Renewable Energy, Energy Laboratory, and, uh, which was DOE lab and, uh, and USDA. Was it? 1998 was that original study, and, it, and that study's been updated for energy balance and greenhouse gases. I haven't seen a recent number on those, those water figures. But that, and that's an important way to protect water resources. If you, if you don't pollute water in the first place, that's, that's a good thing to do for water resources. Uh, Biodiesel is also, of course you know this, non-toxic biodegradable in the event of spills, there's less impact relative to petroleum. There's also a, an interesting nexus between water resources and energy in general. Uh, you know, we, were we were talking earlier this morning that there's lots of water on the planet, just most of it's not drinkable or it's not in the place where we need it. So every, you know, most of the water that we touch or consume as humans is, is brought to us by a pipe or is treated in some way which requires energy. So as long as we're reliant on fossil energy to clean and treat and move our water, we don't really have good access to water. We need uh, renewable energy so that we always have access to, to clean water. I've got a question about the water. So you mentioned wastewater. Um, when people, one of the things people say about biodiesel is the inputs that go into making the crop. I don't want to get too deep into that, but like from the water side, when you look at total water use to produce biofuels in general, um, are there any numbers on that? Because wastewater, I don't even really know what wastewater means in terms of producing petroleum. I'm not quite sure what that's for, but yeah, well, and I'll talk more about the biodiesel side because I understand that more. Can you ask, answer well, your question in, first? Or? In large production facilities, they actually have wastewater regulations. They got to deal with the municipality, and they recycle their wastewater, keep reusing it. And many of those plants actually have a negative water balance, and that they have to bring water in. They recycle and they lose it through evaporation. Talk about petroleum. They, uh, petroleum plants. Biodiesel plants. Okay. So the question is, what, yeah. where do they use water to buy diesel plants? And diesel plants. Yeah, it's, it's two parts. One is where do they use water in the production or whatever of, of petroleum, and then what about the water used to grow the crops? How does that factor in? If you, if you were to compare all the water yeah. in petroleum and all the water, I mean, yeah. I could speak to those about biodiesel. I, I know a little bit less about the petroleum side. I think a, a lot of that is in the exploration and drilling and, and underground injection. Mm -hmm. um, actually, okay. DOE has a good quantification of, of the water use for petroleum. Extraction. So we've been helping them um, develop some background on how much how much water is used or impacted when producing biodiesel. <coughs> and we, we did a survey and we found the results to be so variable that we didn't we decided we didn't do our survey well enough. But people quantify water use in lots of different ways. Uh, you know whether they, they use it and like Ken said some of it evaporates or whether they use it and treat it and release it back to the stream and it's good or better shape than it was when they extracted it or whether they used wastewater to begin with. Um, one of the, the major water uses in biodiesel production is washing of the biodiesel. And you know we've got some biodiesel producers that don't do water washing. They said, well, you know, if water was critical, we could make biodiesel without using any water at all. The trade-off is that it might require more energy. So depending on the cost of energy or where you're at, the uh, impacts how you design your process. If you're in a water-rich area and you have access to, to treatment that you could use water and put it back in the environment in, in good condition, there's no reason not to use water in the process. But if you're in an arid area where you don't have water, it may make sense to invest a little bit more energy in the process to make a, a 
bodies with no water. If we, and we, we look to see what the average water use was per gallon of biodiesel. And it's on the range of a third to a half a gallon of water for every gallon of biodiesel. So that's kind of a national average based on what's used at the biodiesel plant. And we quantified that. Actually, I haven't looked at the numbers uh, recently, but in 2008, which was a record year for biodiesel production, we had 790 million gallons of production. The entire biodiesel industry, every plant in the country, used less water than they used to irrigate a golf course in San Antonio. So, so in, in that kind of perspective, it's, uh, we really have a good, a good profile. Now, if you extend that life cycle now, so look at, look at what, how much water did it take to produce the crop. And when we often look at life cycle analysis for the National Biodiesel Support, we go to soybeans, because that's the biggest single feedstock we have. It's about 47% of all the biodiesel is produced from, from soybeans. And that tends to be the crop that people have the most questions about. They're like, well, you know, you're growing this crop and you're using a virgin oil. What's the life cycle analysis of that? So if we look at our national average, how much water does it take to irrigate soybeans and convert that into biodiesel? We looked at that as well. And only about 10% of the soybean acres around the country are irrigated. Uh, years like, like this, when we actually have a drought, we actually wish there were more ir crops that are irrigated because you know, if you're tapping into groundwater or something like that, you can you can level out volatility in, in natural weather phenomena. So it actually makes a lot of sense to irrigate. And the places that do irrigate, they show yield gains of 35% relative to crops that aren't irrigated. And you think about all the investment that goes into growing crops, the, the land and the seed and the fuel for the tractor driving back and forth, all those inputs, if you can add a little bit of water and, gain, and increase yield by 35%, it would actually be criminal not to do that, to optimize that system. But if we look at our national average, factoring in that only about 10% of the, the crop is irrigated and the rest of it's rain fed, and we added up all that water and divided it around the biodiesel produced, it comes out to, if you look at a state like <coughs> Iowa, where the, Iowa's the biggest soybean producer biggest biodiesel producer, or neck and neck with Texas sometimes. Uh, it comes out to about two gallons of water per, per gallon of biodiesel. And, and that number affects people in different ways. Some people say, oh, two gallons, that's nothing to worry about. Some people think that's a lot of water. So you, you kind of have to look at it in relative to other industries. If you look at, um, say, um, a gallon of coffee or a gallon of orange juice, probably takes 40 gallons of water to make a make a gallon of orange juice if you look at the same kind of water inputs for the crop and the process and things like that. So, so we can be proud of our, of our water footprint. We can be proud of the fact that we're developing renewable energy and secure our future access to, to clean water. And it also makes sense if you look at the fact that due to uh, programs like the low carbon fuel standard, we may be importing a lot of Midwestern um, biodiesel to, to satisfy the low carbon fuel standard. And that actually makes sense because you're, you're importing water, but you don't have to ship it. Because we, we grew a product in the Midwest where there's plenty of water, and, and we're bringing a, a, an energy product that has virtually dense water content in it to an arid region that doesn't have enough water. So it's actually, it's actually a good way to manage water resources. And if, I, actually, I think I'm going to go back to this first picture. My, my opening slide is a picture I took in Iowa two weeks ago. And they are all tore up about the drought. They are worried it's the worst drought they've seen since the 80s. And they're worried about crop fields. It's kind of dark. You can't see it. But for anybody in California, that doesn't look like a drought to you. It's all, it's all relative. You know, everything is lush and green and, and beautiful in Iowa. And they, they're worried about their drought. So it's, it's all relative to, to your region. Any other questions about water? Well, the comment on the oil refineries, they're really in the uh, oil boiling business. It takes a lot of energy to get this oil boiled, a lot of distillation work. Mm -hmm. And that, that energy has to be taken out. They do it with cooling towers. We evaporated an awful lot of water in our cooling towers mm -hmm. and concentrated. Now you have a salty water to get rid of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes people ask me, like, well, how much water does it take to make biodiesel relative to how much water it takes to make petroleum? And I was like, well, you really can't compare the two because you can't make petroleum with water. You know, all the, the petroleum that exists, it exists because it's there. You can only find it. You can't produce it. And the only way to accurately compare those two would be to add up all the water 
it was used by all the organisms over hundreds of millions of years to concentrate that, that energy in fossil fuels. So it, it's not an apples to apples uh, comparison because you can't make petroleum. Whereas uh, renewable fuels, we can continue to make them using water, which is another renewable resource, and that's exactly exactly what we need to be doing. But but like he said, we can figure out how much it how much water it takes to process the fossil fuel into a usable petroleum yeah. fuel. Yeah, and that's typically what they do. I bet it's very, very high. I mean, a little plastic bottle takes four gallons of water to make. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it depends on the way you draw the boundaries for that life cycle assessment, for sure. Yeah, a couple questions over here. It's really just a comment, I think. More just, the water is always a solvable problem. I mean, you can always desal. I mean, you know, look you at Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It's not impossible to do that. And it's, you've got a re renewable resource. Yes, it's a it's a nice thing to make people annoyed right now. You know, you know, oh, we're using up water, but that's not as opposed to using up carbon. Do you right. mean that's that's really the comparison yeah. I, would, I would report? Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah. Argon Laboratories is three point four to six point six gallons per gasoline. Hmm. Just as an example. One more time. Yeah. Uh, 3.4 to 6.6 for gasoline from U.S. conventional crude. And one of the reasons we've worked so hard on quantifying what is our water footprint is because there are some old government references for biodiesel that are really wrong. There's, there's, the, there's a DOE report from Sandia back in 2006. Uh, said, they said it takes 6,000 gallons of water to make a gallon of biodiesel. And you know, they didn't understand the math they were doing on calculating crop yields. They didn't understand allocating between oil and meal. So, so that's why we stepped up. We said, okay, we need to find our industry rather than people who don't really understand. Yeah, so that's, and that, that's really how my position with the National Body Use Board got, got cemented, was that we need to be defining our profile. When you guys were studying the water issues, did you look at the fertilizer that's typically all petroleum? And the water is required for the fertilizer, and also <clears throat> a lot of times in Iowa, especially, I think there's a lot of nitrate pollution that goes into the wells from excess fertilizer use, and a lot of fertilizer ends up running off into the rivers and then pollutes the Mississippi River and goes all the way down to the Gulf. I guess a huge water issue as well that's directly yeah. impacted by agriculture. So I don't know if you guys looked at any of those. Yeah, and I've got some issues. slides way back at the end of my slide deck about quantifying uh, nitrogen use and things like that, nitrogen use efficiency as, as farming continues to increase. And we didn't. That was separate from our water life cycle analysis, how much water do we use. Mm -hmm. um, that the nitrogen and any of the fertilizer input uses are included in the life cycle analysis to quantify energy use and greenhouse gases. So all the production of, of fertilizer uh, is included in that, the greenhouse gases and, and the energy to develop and to transport the fertilizer. Um, it's a much bigger issue for, for corn. You know. Soy, we're actually in a fortunate position. Soy is planted in rotation with corn because the, the, the soy fixes nitrogen in the soil. A lot of farmers, they probably be making more money if they just grew corn after corn after corn year after year. But they'll plant soy, it used to be every other year, they'll plant soy to restore that, that nitrogen into their soil so they don't have to buy fertilizer. Um, and so it's one of the things, other thing we brag about the biodiesel industry is we've, we've helped maintain that balance. Ethanol has boomed so big Corn yields have gone up, corn prices have gone up, the farmers have a lot of incentive to plant corn after corn. And by helping develop a little bit of price stability for the oil part for the soybean crop, we can uh, we can help maintain some acres of soybeans, help maintain that natural balance of putting natural fertilizer back in the soil, as well as breaking up <coughs> pest infestations. You know, if you're planting the same crop year after year, the, the, the pests that feed on those plants are, are going to grow in population. So we need to cultivate a crop and breaks up those cycles as well. There's also other benefits as far as um, just aerating the tilt of the soil, reducing compaction, things like that by, by rotating crops. And then, you know, when I'm talking about the economics of soybeans, we're actually, by helping keep more soy acres in soy versus going corn on corn, we're actually helping produce more, um, you know, protein-rich protein meal for, for livestock feed, particularly um, swine and poultry and, and, and dairy cattle. It's 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 all it's all a big system. Everything is connected, and it's uh, and there's a lot more to it than, than most of our, our critics usually guess at the first first opportunity. So you know, that's why we try to do the best we can to, to put <coughs> the life cycle analysis and put these facts and figures out there.
You really, gotta work on your sound bite though. These are really great questions. Sound bite? Yeah. Well and that's the that's the difficult thing we, we face is this food versus fuel thing is a great sound bite. People can say, yeah, we shouldn't we shouldn't be driving cars, we should be feeding people. And it and it sticks. It doesn't matter that it's not true. And we've really been challenged to try and tell the real story because it, we can't wrap it up in eight seconds. You know, it takes us at least three minutes to talk about, well, you know, when you make soybeans, you're producing 80% protein meal and 20% oil, and most of the oil still goes for food uses, but we use about 400 million gallons for, for biodiesel, and in the meantime, we're actually reducing the price of livestock feed, we're not increasing it. So we are challenged that we have a complicated story. Um, and it's probably helping America diet. What's that? <laughs> you're helping America diet. Yeah. Well, and the fact is that we don't drive the American diet. The American diet drives us. Everything we make biodiesel out of is a co-product of, of a food industry of one kind, whether it's a little bit of soybean oil coming out of the livestock feed industry, or whether it's you know recycled fryer oil, or whether it's animal fats. It's the it's the food market that drives us, and we take the, we literally take the scraps. So, um, and I think there are opportunities to to grow the biodiesel industry beyond that. But uh, for a long time, I think it's going to be it's going to be us taking the scraps and making making the best of it. So yeah, I'm interested in that part. I, I keep hearing that land is being reused, and maybe this is another conversation. But land is being used differently now to grow crops than were before, uh, specifically for biofuels. Would you say that's true in the U.S. or not so true in the U.S.? Well, we you know farmers have always done a good job increasing their efficiency, <coughs> increasing their production. We've helped them with that. You know, so I got my T-shirt. Twenty years of biodiesel. The National Biodiesel Board was founded in 1992. Actually, founded as the Soy Diesel Development Board because the farmers are like, you know, we're we're producing protein meal to, to feed livestock. We've got all this oil. We need to find something to do with this oil. It's like, can we put it in a truck? Can we just burn the stuff? And uh, so originally started with trying to get rid of their excess oil, and then realizing that yeah, indeed, this works and it's good fuel and. We might actually be able to do something more than just get rid of our oil. We might be able to displace and control it. Wouldn't that be cool? And it's like, well, you know, we can make this stuff out of animal fats too. Let's get the renderers in here. Let's form a bigger club. Let's get all of the feedstocks together and see if we can form a viable industry and actually do, you know, create a, a larger good there. And one of the things that the soybean farmers recognize is, that, you know, if we build this biodiesel industry to go off and be self sustaining, it doesn't have to be about soybean oil. It doesn't matter uh, how much soybean oil is used in biodiesel because we can always sell our excess to that market if we have excess. And if that biodiesel should could stand on itself using animal fats, recycled oils, all the better. So. But Jason, I mean, I think your question is an important one. Are we putting more land into use? Is that what you're asking yeah, because of biofuels? I, I guess I wonder that. Um, I mean, a couple things. One is if we're growing, if we're planting net new fields, it's back to the food versus fuel thing. You know, are we planting net new fields with net new acres that weren't in use? Just like when the corn subsidies came out in the 70s and they said, you know, I've seen the movie King Corn, it's a great one. It talks about how, you know, corn farmers had this much land and they used this much for corn, then they had a place for their house, a place for their barn, and they show the same property like two years later, and they're going out to the street. You know, they're using every because they're getting subsidies for corn. Uh, are we growing net new uh, acres for biofuels specifically? I, I hear that over here, like from the media, we'll say, and then I hear kind of what you're saying, which is we take the scraps from, and that's a great. I like that line a lot. It's easy. It's an easy question, Matt. It's it's not just me saying. It's actually federal law, the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard, which really uh, governs renewable fuel use in the U.S. and definitely drives the biodiesel market says that if it's an agricultural product, it can only come from land that was already in production in 2007. So it's, right. it's a, it's a okay. no exemption uh, prohibition against, against land clearing. So if we're not creating net new, um, what's the one-liner about? Um, is there oil being diverted from one thing to another in the U.S.? Well, I think you also have to think about who you're defining when you say we. Uh, every week, if not every day, I get emails uh, translated from Chinese saying, do I want to buy uh, oil on consignment from China? And uh, I've had uh, 
talks with people saying, we'd love to be able to supply the biodiesel made from palm kernel oil that we're building, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, taking a, a crop plant, we're producing new crop plant for palm, uh, palm tree for palm kernel oil. And when you look at it, liquid fuel is an international uh, uh, business. And, and that was, that was and, 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 and the whole that, point of that, that international business is where do they drive uh, to maximize profits? And if, and if it's possible to push palm kernel oil through a government that uh, that can be uh, bought off, so you can destroy uh, 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 peat bogs and, and other crop lands and create you know a, a, a carbon uh, problem locally for that area. Uh, but globally drive down the price of the, uh, the uh, feed oil commodity, the feedstock commodity, they're going to go after it. They being uh, 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 some competitor to you who's, who's got a cheaper source of, source of oil. So I, I jumped ahead here to, to some, some quotes I've got from the Federal Renewable Fuel Standard. And actually, the, the, so the two largest markets for, um, for renewable fuels, you know, we've got the U.S., we've got Strong, uh, markets in Europe and then in South America, they they, they actually uh, they use a lot of renewable fuels, but they're exporting fuels to Europe as well. Um, so in the U.S., the renewable fuel standard really governs uh, renewable fuel production, and there's two two hurdles that you have to to meet um, for the biodiesel market, is anyway, and that's that's meeting the definition of biomass-based diesel or advanced biofuel, which says you have to have a 50% greenhouse gas reduction relative to petroleum to, to, in order to play. The other one is that definition of renewable biomass, and there's, <coughs> so I have the quote, renewable biomass includes recycled and waste greases, includes algae, but for agricultural products, it says it has to come from land that was existing agricultural land, there'll be no land clearing. And they've, they've actually gone through a process in the U.S., they work with USDA, and they've looked at uh, agricultural statistics data, and they said, you know, we haven't increased cropland in the U.S. since 1959. Farmers have been producing more, but they've been producing more on less land because they've been getting more efficient. So the only land use change we really see in the U.S. is golf courses and subdivisions and shopping malls. So we, we lose two acres of farmland every every minute to, to development, but we're not expanding uh, crop acres. So they work with USDA and they also work with the Canadian government and they came up with the same kind of analysis. So they said that any of the agricultural products with soybean oil or canola oil from the U.S. or Canada meets that definition of renewable biomass. Anything from outside those areas, anything imported, whether it's fuel or feedstock, has to certify that it, it came from the existing crop. So that that shut down anybody trying to expand and grow uh, new crops for for biofuels. Now there are opportunities to, and I think this all have to be justified through EPA. It'll have to be a petition process and rulemaking. And it'll, it'll be public and, and transparent because I think there are opportunities to take land that's not being used effectively or um, perhaps adding double cropping or, or winter cover crops in order to, to make new crops. Uh, but I'll show you what's covered to date. These are the feedstocks that EPA has approved for, for biodiesel. So that includes soybean oil, canola, corn oil from ethanol plants. Right now that only includes the inedible oil that comes out of the back end as a byproduct of ethanol production. <coughs> I have heard that that some of the corn industry is interested in getting a pathway for corn oil biodiesel, not because they think they'll provide a lot of volume, but just because they want that they want that option. If they ever end up with a surplus of corn oil, they want the option to be able to put it in biodiesel. Animal fats, recycled grease, waste grease, uh, camelina and sunflower are a couple of the latest ones to be analyzed by, uh, by EPA. Algae is actually the only one on the list that didn't go through a full life cycle assessment. Congress and EPA um, literally gave the green light to algae, saying if somebody can make an algae that's economically viable, then we know the biodiesel industry can produce into renewable fuel tomorrow, and we're, we're interested in seeing that on the market. So for, for any of the first use oils, they also had to pass the test of indirect land use change, we do a global economic modeling to make sure that even though we're not taking oil from this acre of agricultural land and making biofuels, we want to make sure that we're not indirectly expanding agriculture in other parts of the world. Or at least that it's limited so that it 
doesn't detract from that 50% GHG threshold. So, so currently, those are those are the feedstocks that, that compete in the national market um, for biodiesel mm -hmm. advanced. How often do they update this list? You know? So anytime somebody petitions them to add it, um, the, the, palm, the palm industry from Southeast Asia has been, has been working at it for uh, you know, over a year trying to get their analysis accepted. And to date, EPA hasn't, hasn't approved that. I don't hear a lot about Pennycrest. You know, looking at yeah, so Pennycrest falls into one of those uh, winter crop um, where I, I've, heard, I've heard tremendous things about the ability to produce a lot of oil um, on existing acres, yeah. growing it in the winter. So in addition to producing oil, you're actually you know, preventing some erosion and maybe sequestering some carbon in the process. So that's another another bright spot for the future. That's a good point. You, I don't know if you mentioned it at first, but uh, rotational crop, it's not in that list, but isn't, doesn't it, to generate a REN, for example, um, any rotational crop that's in between the other ones, and I don't know that much about agriculture, but doesn't that include a bunch of crops that aren't on that list? It could be on that list. It should, and I haven't seen that list developed. But it should be, yeah, that should be the case. If you're if you're growing a crop like pennycress, <laughs> you you probably can't get around the life cycle analysis. But that should be pretty straightforward. But you might be able, through that argument, saying if a winter cover crop, you could avoid the indirect land use change analysis, which that's what's really time consuming and controversial. Because if I'm a, 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 a distributor and I want to buy biodiesel from somebody. I just want to look at the list because if, if I'm the producer, I would know. Well, this came between this and this, or that—that's too much. I need a list. Yeah, and for the RFS, if you're on the list, you're on the list. They all compete the same. It's—it's it's different than the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, where different feedstocks compete based on different uh, carbon intensities. Okay. I just want to get to your question. Yeah, this—if this has a quick answer, then it's fine. But if not, yeah. so what's the mechanism? that prevents me, I own 100 acres of land. I got 50 acres in farming, I got 50 acres in forest. And I produce the feedstocks on that acres that have already been planted so it meets the 200. And then I clear the, the other. What's the, in, you're talking about the indirect land use analysis. So now I'm growing something else on, on that forest land, but technically it's not the oil because it's coming from land that I already had in production. So that indirect, what's the mechanism to prevent that? So, yeah, so EPA and USDA, this was all through the, their public rule processing, um, that determined that that's just not a likely scenario. And, and the economic modeling from Purdue and others back that up, say that if a farmer's got so much crop land, he's got so much forest land, that the economic incentive doesn't exist for him to cut that down. For one, it costs money to cut trees down, at least costs some labor. Well, actually, and you can sell them. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's you make that's money cutting trees down. <laughs> Another thing is that, that USDA reported well, why farmers can't increase land is because of a lot of the farm commodities or the subsidy programs or the insurance programs. You know, a farmer can't get crop insurance on on a piece of ground that doesn't have a, a crop history. So if you you cut down those trees and plant a crop, um, you'd be having a lot more risk financially. Than your existing crops, and the, and the margins are so thin that it's just it's just economically not worth it for a farmer. So they're saying that the natural net market forces can't be doing it anyway. Yeah. If it was if, if it was practical, they'd already have done it, whether it was for biodiesel. Or yeah, and we have seen stuff. we have seen land prices, cash rent, and sale of land prices go up uh, a lot for existing ag land because it has that history. It can get. They can get subsidy payments, they can get crop insurance, but the same is not true for, you know, for what would be recreational land or timber land or wildlife land. Question on this list, um, and under RFS, these oils are, does RFS specify that these oils can only come from the United States and or Canada with canola, or can these oils be imported from other countries? They can be imported. And if you import them, you have to certify specifically what piece of land it came from, and then it was not converted after 2007. Wasn't the canola from Canada a pathway to rent and it's just <coughs> been passed recently, and that there was some gotcha to that? It was, yeah, it was I missed done, the question. It was, it was done later. The, the canola pathway was not included in the original uh, rule. It was, it was followed up a few months later. But I mean, even canola grown in Canada imported to the U.S. was different than canola in the U.S. Treated different under the standard? Yeah, that was my understanding. I mean, 
living in Washington, that, that's what I had heard about why people in Washington couldn't use canola because canola is kind of contaminated. Well, you know, two things happened. Once, one, they did the life cycle analysis to prove that it met the GHG threshold, and that was good for all canola, no matter where it came from. Okay. And then, then the the aggregate certification that Canadian product meets the definition of removable biomass was a separate thing. So those two things happened separately. Okay, so there was first acceptance of canola from the U.S., then acceptance of canola from Canada. So essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you used, um, say, ethanol, for instance, instead of methanol, which is fossil fuel, would that offset? So you have a feed stock that's slightly above 50%, but maybe yeah. you bring it back down because now you don't have yeah. ethanol. Is that any kind of a... Yeah. So if you so if you did anything, whether it was switching your your, your alcohol or anything in your process that, that made your GHG um, profile better than the average, there you get nothing from the RFS. It doesn't matter. Okay. We, we, you already meet the fifty percent threshold. That's all that matters. You play in the game. You're trading. For the low carbon fuel standard, that would be different. But that's only California. Yeah. So California. So <coughs> then you would. In order to get that credit, you'd have to go through a process with California to say, here's here's what our life cycle looks like. Give us our own path. I mean, several ethanol plants have actually, have actually gone through that process. Sorry, I have an order from your facility. I really, I'm, this is really awesome. You guys have all these questions, so keep them coming. Let's just go back and see if we missed anything. Well, if you don't have another slide, I've got another question about yeah, sort of the global market. Um, so. You know, if biofuels scale up, I'll just say biodiesel. So if biodiesel scales up to, um, can you speak up just because? Yeah. Sure. Back. Yeah, no problem. Here. So my question is about the global market, and if biodiesel scales up, so today we're importing 50%. That's that's like how we phrase it, but it, you can't really say we're importing 50% because we also export. You know, it's more complicated than that. Let's say that we produce um, 10 billion gallons of, of biodiesel, um, because energy is such a global thing. Um, Aren't we just going to export it because the price is more somewhere else? And like, how does bio, how do biofuels uh, get to us to energy independence without us just shipping it off to sell it somewhere else? How do we? Yeah. So in other words, how do we make sure that we're actually displacing fossil fuel in, in RF? Country. Yeah. And yeah, and that's so, that's something that the that the RFS I, I think it does, but it doesn't do without some cracks. So the, the RFS says we're going to use this much renewable fuel, and, and there's been economic studies that say, yeah, if you're putting this renewable fuel in the market, it's going to displace petroleum. Now the, the low carbon fuel standard is a little bit more airtight on that because it says whatever fuel you use is going to be ranked by carbon intensity, and you're going to be forced to use the the lowest carbon intensity fuels. I guess what I'm saying is we don't. I mean, if we produce 10 billion gallons of biodiesel in the U.S and there's a global market for biodiesel, and it's a little higher in China, uh, and we just ship 90% of it over there, we haven't actually increased our independence at all, have we? Well, let me... The global market is so traded and, and it's skewed with tax credits, and they were drop shipping Argentinian fuel up to here to send it to Europe, right. and they were, at one point, California, Argentinian soy diesel was cheaper to bring around the horn and up than to get Midwest biodiesel rail cart out because they're shipping rail cars to you know stuff to Europe and it's all skewy but when we talk about making 10 billion gallons of biodiesel annually here in the country California uses 7.2 billion gallons of diesel every year so we could suck up all the biodiesel in California and the rest of the country and get none but we wouldn't okay. because we would sell it overseas yeah, that, that's why but that, I mean, it's, it's, it's really skewed yeah, but to answer your question you get you have to look at the bigger picture because, okay, you're cutting into fuel consumption. So, okay, so we get that we're, if China's buying the biodiesel, they're not buying the oil from Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, the oil petroleum is displaced. Correct. One way or the other. Agreed. It's, it's just, not in the United that States. Just, well, you can't, how do you know? I mean, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't support the goal of American independence. Well, in a way, it does because now you have farmers who have a, uh, a profit to constantly making fuel. So then, you know, when the when the market reshifts and, and the gas becomes more expensive here, then they'll sell it here. 
if but, we produce it, we have the option of using it or selling it. Right. I mean, is there any mechanism to prevent it, any percentage? Like, you mentioned RFS, which I think is a good point, but, but I'm saying if we're exporting it, um, how does it support American independence? Yeah. And we're, and we're, we're currently not exporting biodiesel. So we, we did in 2007, 2008, we shipped a bunch of biodiesel to Europe because they had all this demand, they wanted it, we could make it cheaper than they could make it, and so that, that actually got our industry off the ground was Europeans buying our biodiesel. <laughs> Europeans essentially financed the, the building of 150 biodiesel plants all around our country. And, uh, and people had that question, like, you know, we didn't build this, we didn't build this industry to, to provide fuel to Europe. But it didn't matter, because we made a bunch of money on it. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it's about. Right. And now, you know, that's what the industry is about, right? And now we own that infrastructure. Let me, yeah, okay. Now we have a renewable fuel standard that says, OK, we're going to use it. So we're not sending it over. And, and the Europeans also, they didn't like it. The Europeans, yeah. by these yeah. 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 put a tariff on it. I would say that yeah, I mean it doesn't really matter. I mean it's like the in, the independence is the infrastructure because you know if there's all of a sudden disruption in oil supply, you know having the infrastructure to at least make 10 million gallons of biodiesel is what is going to be important. Well, what that, I'm looking at is the media whole. sound bites of we we import this percentage and we could displace this percentage and you know this much comes from the Middle East and would politicians say by using biofuels this this. And then other people say that's not really true because of all these other things. I just want to be clear that if we produce it and ship it overseas, that's not America. It's maybe uh, there's a, a way you could say it could be in certain, certain circumstances in the future lead to American energy independence. But it wouldn't be what it's controlling the resources. So right now, RFS, the, I guess. It's the renewable fuel standard that's driving biodiesel in the U.S. We, last year was a record year. We made 1.1 billion gallons of biodiesel. All used domestically for the for okay. the RFS, and one of the, the the keys to that is is that um, was originally designed not as a driver to grow the industry, but as a, as a backstop, because we recognized that OPEC could open the valves and flood the market with cheap petroleum and run all the biodiesel plants out of business, and everything we built over the last decade or so would would be would be sacrificed. So we have this. The RFS providing a, a minimum fuel volume to keep all these biodiesel plants idling so that we own that infrastructure and keep the jobs that, that we develop. Yeah. Uh, is there a, the, I mean, arguably, arguably, a bigger global market is a good thing. And at the point where American people are willing to pay what the rest of the world's willing to pay for their, then we have it. But you know, until I think the whole bio, the renewable fuels industry in, in general suffers from artificially low priced. Fossil fuels. I mean, you yeah. could get it from one third of the rest of the world, except if you're in Kuwait. But you know, so I mean, until American people are willing to spend all the money at the pump and not some at the pump, but some on April 15th right. for their fuel, you know, it's going to be that way. So having those as overseas markets is important to the development of the industry. I don't think it's a bad thing. But exporting fuel over large distances takes up a, a large amount to, of energy and it's grossly inefficient at reaching your your overall goals of being um, using a domestic products, energy independence, um, pollution, environmental, greenhouse gas. So you can do it. You can do it to meet a particular goal, but it's grossly inefficient. Yeah, and the, sure. the real threat sure. is not in the biodiesel market, it's actually in the, in the ethanol market because the federal policy is yeah. favoring sugarcane ethanol. So we've got sugarcane ethanol coming from South America, they've got demand for ethanol, so they're importing corn ethanol. We've got ethanol ships passing. It's ludicrous. <laughs> but, you know, until enough people... And lucrative. That's what some yeah, it's ludicrous. <laughs> and lucrative. I think we had to... Yeah, yeah. just to... Yeah, so, to the 1%. Do you know... Yeah, and because the question is actually valid, like, how much... If, if we turned on the faucets of making biodiesel on farmland, how much biodiesel can really be made? Yes. Because it doesn't I'm sound like glad you, you can make question. that much. I'm glad you asked that question. It gets me That's right back on track yeah. with what our industry goal is. Um, <coughs> and the National Biodiesel Board, its members and its leadership um, developed this goal before I came to work here. They said by 2015, we want to displace 5% of our petroleum diesel in the U.S. And they base that number on, on what's available, quantified, how much soybean oil is in the market, how much canola, how much uh, recycled vegetable oil, how much uh, animal fats would be available. So by, by 2015, we want to be 5% of, of diesel fuel. So we're, we're about halfway there. Um, 
five percent is a little over two billion, two and a half billion gallons. So we made a billion gallons last year. Um, the goal is to is to meet that with a, a mix of blends. You know, we expect to see five percent biodiesel, a really common blend. We don't see as much B20 in fleets and certain markets as possible, and even B100 in, in niche markets. Um, and the key to that is that diverse mix of feedstock. So we recognize in order to be that significant, we're going to have to pull in every strain of feedstock we can get. But is there is there a study that says what we're capable of producing is the question. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Oh, is that the next slide? Yeah. If you really want to get the charts and graphs, they're way down in the slide deck. I figured you guys would be interested in this. Five percent. So that that equates to, for instance, about 400 million gallons of soybean oil. That's that's it. Yeah, it's only that's only 10 percent of the soybean oil that's produced. But we look at economically, that's how much we can draw to our industry. So to hit five percent, you're saying all we have to make is about 400 million gallons of biodiesel? No, that that's soybean. Oil. Okay. We have about about 400 million gallons of soybean oil, about 250 million gallons of recycled grease. Oh, got it. So, so just so the soybean oil, oil portion of it. Pull okay. All of these. And we've done specific analysis on each of those markets, looking at I mean, how many how many animals are slaughtered in the U.S. and how much fat does that produce, and what are the global markets for that? Saying, well, half of that's going to get exported for other uses, half of it will stay here in the U.S. Uh, we've even tried to do some regional analysis, trying to determine what what could be used in California to meet the low carbon fuel standard versus what's going to be used in other parts of the country. Sorry, what was that number again? Well, for what's, what's the, the best thing to do would be to get you the actual maximum. references than me quoting some of these numbers off the top of my head. We said 400 million gallons. Right? Yeah, no, that was just the that's, annual portion. That's million. approximately what we use. So what's what's the starting point for that five percent? So if it's I two and a half billion, how many gallons, gallons of, buy, of diesel percent. fuel in the United States is that you times by five percent mm -hmm. to get the numbers? Right. So what is it about? Mm -hmm. it's we think it's sixty or fifty-five billion. Okay, sixty-four, sixty-five. I've heard. Yeah, and I don't know what, it is, what that specific number is. It's approximately 65 billion gallons a year in diesel and about 200 billion in gasoline, I think. Okay. More than about 33 times more. Okay, let me ask kind of a, you know, as the, the times are changing, uh, people are becoming more healthy. It's just diesel like that. Yeah. You know, there's an argument to be made that this well, is all diesel. Hey, Jason, can you speak, like speak up? I think there's yes. some other yeah. conversations. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so just one conversation. Okay. So, you know, as, as our world is moving towards more health conscious, more organic, more local for food, um, you know, there's an argument to be made that this is all based on what is essentially a corrupt industry of big ag and factory farms. So I've sold biodiesel that comes from animal fat and it's good product in the summertime. So I have an internal conflict there myself, but you know, I, I kind of wonder sometimes, are we really supporting people eating factory farmed meat? Uh, that's where the slaughterhouse stuff comes from. And the meal that's going there, I mean, I always say, uh, cows should eat grass, not grease. But you can kind of say they should be eating grass, not grains. So Maybe we should be eating grass instead of cows. There hey, are people that say that. I'm, I'm not um, even going there. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have gone there. I mean, you have gone there. You Looking know, at these bigger, these much so bigger grass. questions beyond biodiesel and beyond transportation fuels of what are society's habits of, of eating. You know, and you know, you, you point out correctly that all of our grain production goes not to feed people but to feed animals so that we can eat the animals. You look at that the trends in meat consumption, they, you know, they continue to go up worldwide. Some of the good news in that is that the trend has moved from less beef to more, more swine and more poultry, which are more efficient converters of protein. So we're actually feeding more meat to the world, for better or worse, but we're feeding them using less acres because they're more efficient than cattle. Um, and I, and I don't want to get a debate either, because there's people that will say that confined animal feeding operations are more efficient than, than cows on grass. To me, you know, it, I would rather see a cow on grass too. It just it just feels better. Um, <laughs> it doesn't taste better, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard if you, I've heard even those organic farmers say you got to have a little corn at the end there if you want it. If you want it to taste good. Choke them just a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, question. Okay. Back. I'm back a little bit. I've been. Can you speak up? Jumping back a little bit, trying to get in a, que a question regarding the soybean from overseas. You're saying that if you have soybean that can be certified that they're coming from farmland overseas, that yeah, the United States government will allow those soybean with to come in, or they will allow the oil from the soybean that is produced there to come in to make. Yeah. What, what kind of tariff we're talking? Is is the tariff there's, there's, always there's, the benefit? There's no there's no U.S. tariff on 
on the imports. There are there is some differential export tariffs in South America where they they favor exporting biodiesel instead of exporting the oil because yeah. they would rather have that that, that industry, industry in their home. country. Right. So and we see see the opposite thing on uh, China wants to import soybeans. They don't want to import meal because they want the uh, the value out of the industry in their in their country. They want to make they want to make jobs producing separating the oil and the meal. <clears throat> so that's why you're seeing ads of people selling oil from China because they really just need the meal and they they're trying to sell the oil back to us. I've been wondering about that. Ridiculous to good price was there. And it's like from James, Chris, yeah. David. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what seawater looks like when it comes in uh, containers that are supposed to be oil, though. <laughs> I was wondering about that. $70,000 lost to a guy in Canada. Chinese oil. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so in order to, to meet this 5% goal, it, it really is it really is a significant number. It's significant in terms of energy security, significant in terms of emissions. You know, 5% is about how much diesel we get specifically from Iraq. 5% is about a quarter of the diesel we get from all the Middle Eastern regions. So we can make a difference. In order to do that, we need a significant volume. So rather than placing bounds on we only want this type of feedstock or this type of feedstock, we said we only want to produce biodiesel, we only want to represent biodiesel that has fuel quality performance, that meets uh, fuel quality specifications, and biodiesel that's that's sustainable. Okay. Just so you knew, I did some numbers. We estimated 65 billion on-road gallons of diesel fuel. That would be 3.25 billion gallons of biodiesel <coughs> for on-road consumption. So, so that's what he's talking about when we need that. And so I recall, it's in my later slides, I recall, I think we actually said we could get to that three billion number by 2022. So that's not matching up to that 215 goal, but uh, some of the economic analysis is mature. We originally developed that 215 goal. Uh, <coughs> over the years, the ASTM standard seems to have been uh, goalposts seem to get farther and farther away in some of the testing protocols. Getting, getting more more stringent, more, more stringent. expensive to, yes. to meet it. Um, and I, I'm wondering who's, you know, where are the sidebars on that? Because as our demand increases, um, the ability to make fuel increases, uh, but the testing requirement can put put the restriction that only ma only makes it feasible for large operations to survive and smaller operations. Yeah, well, lose and I would, that ability. Yeah, and I would say that we're seeing that that growth in demand because we're seeing more consumer confidence, we're seeing more uh, confidence from regulators, we're seeing more confidence from engine manufacturers to accept the fuel, so they're growing demand. And, and you're right, in order to, to establish that confidence with the engine manufacturers and the petroleum companies that distribute our product in blends, we have had to work with them to develop the specifications. And, they, and they've had <coughs> constant pressure on us to, to make those specifications more stringent. And all that all that happens at at ASTM. And if you if you have the ability to participate in ASTM, I, I strongly encourage it. It's really a fantastic group of, of technical people to come together and develop consensus standards. To so, the, to the point for the for this crowd for the level of, of production here, is there any kind of industry move or support for essentially the smaller producers being able to produce uh, fatty meth methyl esters and then? selling it to a, a, a more centralized, large-scale processor who can clean it up to be to meet the, the ASTM 6751 standard, rather than it, so it's a, a, a staged industry, rather than trying to do it all in-house at each plant. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Is I that don't know how the, the yes. economics of that would work out, but you know, the industry doesn't have any barriers to that. As long as the finished fuel, everything that hits commerce meets ASTM specification. And that's and that's an uncompromising position. It has to meet the fuel quality specifications. We can't have consumers having problems with engine engine difficulty, even if it's just clogged filters, because it's it's a it's a black eye for the industry and we, we won't be here next year if we've got people stranded alongside the road. So that's an uncompromising position we have to meet those fuel quality specifications. Now the development of those specifications, that that is a compromise because they are developed in consensus. We, we try to recruit uh, members of the National Biodiesel Board to join the ASTM. Individual membership is, is $75, and you can be a voting member 
of, of ASD. So we, we try and uh, coordinate our, our members because we're, we're going into, into consensus meetings with the petroleum companies that are buying biodiesel with obligate parties and distributing it, mixing it with their fuels. Uh, the engine companies are there. The state regulators are there. And there's been constant, constant pressure to, to make those specs more stringent. Actually, in the early days, the pressure was that they just didn't, they just didn't want us in the game, period. But over you know, years of persistence in showing up and, and proving that we are technically credible and we are serious about this, we have gained their respect. And now, now they're actually welcoming us in. They're saying, okay, we, you know, we understand that we're going to be blending biodiesel into the market. We want to make sure it, it works. And so when they see problems in their distribution systems or in their tanks or in their engines, um, this ASTM process is this, they use scientific data to try and determine what's causing the problem and is it and how can we how can we control this through the specification. So it is a compromised position on you know, what the biodiesel industry can can do. It, it always costs more for everybody who has to meet specification. It always costs more to to add a post treatment or do change something in their process to meet a more stringent specification. And it's always a trade off. Like do we want to do we want to stay in this game? Do we want to continue to sell bio, biodiesel on the market, and can we afford to do so? So it's it, it is a, it is a constant it's a constant struggle. It's important that we we stay engaged in developing those specifications. Um, I think I've got some more slides in here about specifications. But while we're on the topic, does anybody else have any more questions about about that? Big one. Are you going to finish by uh, time? I don't know. I can, <laughs> we can. Uh, you got what? Twelve minutes left. Twelve minutes. Yeah, we can do that. Don, you can go a little over so okay. well, you, can, you guys let me know. Like I said, I'm privileged to be here to talk to you guys. I want to answer whatever questions you guys have. Um, on the specifications, I, I guess you mentioned that the the specifications become more stringent over the years. Can you elaborate on that? I'm, just, I'm not familiar with how it's changed. Well, uh, just in the fact that... Uh, so like, like the cold soap filtration cold procedure cold was, yeah. was an example that back in... 2008, and it was you know it was a, a compromised position. Really, officially, it's consensus. So we all agreed to it. In order to establish the, the B5 specification, the B20 specification, which was stuff we had to have to get OEM and acceptance, stuff we had to have to get the renewable fuel standard in place. In order to get to that point, we had to satisfy the OEMs and the, the fuel distribution companies that we didn't have solids falling out of the fuel and clogging their infrastructure. So we had a, a new test procedure in place, and it, and it cost a lot of money for biodiesel producers to, to just to do the tests and then to upgrade their process to make sure they didn't have these solid materials in their fuel falling out later in the distribution system. So those, those challenges continue. We now have got the OEMs asking us if we need to reduce the metals content in biodiesel to make sure that it's compatible with uh, emissions technology. We just, um, we just made some progress on a number one and a number two grade of biodiesel. Because we had people in, in uh, northern climate saying, we've got to have biodiesel that works at minus 30. And that would have been enormously expensive for all the biodiesel plants to change the process okay. for that coal filter. So rather than, than putting that requirement on everybody, we said, OK, we're going to split this. We're going to have a number one grade so that the folks in the northern climates, it's going to cost them more, but they'll be able to get biodiesel they can use in the winter. And the rest of us won't have to pay for that because we don't need them. All right, I've got a race hand here. I've never produced my own self by these days yet. This is my first in any um, interface with anybody or any institution that does that. And I'm hearing the first thing come to my mind based on all on my background. Is there a cooperative movement to put the country in regions where we have one place, one region, where all the small suppliers will be part ownership and we own this plant and you send all the oil here, it does all the testing, all the overhead, and it's done that way, and it's marketed that way. Is there any movement like that? I'd say it's possible, like and we've seen, you know, we've seen some consolidation. <coughs> Brian Roberts is doing a, a talk on uh, co-ops. Okay, because we can compete with, with OPEC. The only way we can compete with OPEC is everybody sharing the costs and sharing the ownership. Hmm. Yeah, there's a thing on the co-ops that, uh, um, this afternoon. This afternoon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, 
question over here. Yeah, I had a question about sterile glucosides. One time we brought uh, some soy-based biodiesel and it got cold, and then the stuff came out of solution, and we tried to heat it up, and we didn't know what it was, and we sent it off to the lab, and they go, this is sterile glucosides. Uh -huh. And uh, it is a big problem, but I've never seen anything in the ASTM spec or any real, and this was a long time ago, so I kind of stopped looking at it. Six, seven. Yeah, and so that was a that was a, a suspect in that the, the cold cold soil filtration test is it might be sterile glucosides, but they at the time that spec was changed, they never really pinned it down on what it was, and in fact they didn't care as long as it wasn't in there. Mm -hmm. So they developed this cold soil filtration test where you, where you make it cold, you let the solids uh, fall out, and you know and measure the filtration time. So that was a, a roundabout way to to satisfy that. Jason, do you have a question? I was going to ask about on OEM, subject of OEM. Good, I'm going to get there. Oh, okay. I mean, the first question was like, well, what are they doing for us? I mean, they keep saying, you know, you got to do this, you got to do this, but when are they going to make an engine oil that can deal with biodiesel? Or when are they going to stop using late injection post combustion or whatever? I mean, what is it they're actually doing, except for, I know they spend money on testing, but uh, what are they doing for us? Okay, um, my next couple slides will get to that and we'll get back in detail. So I mentioned that diversity is key to our sustainability. We have to have diverse feedstocks in order to meet our goals. And unity is also key to success. And it's never been truer than it is for biodiesel industry that it's, it's united we stand or, or divided we fall. You know, biodiesel, we have to maintain consumer support. We have to maintain public policy because the, the national biodiesel uh, market lives or dies by public policy. And, and the fact is that consumers and politicians have very short attention spans. They're pulled in a thousand different directions. So we have to have a unity of voice. We have a consistent message about our benefits and about the kind of policy we need, about the kind of support we need. If, um, you know, if, if we're going to them individually and say, you know, we need a program for waste grease vegetable oil because it's sustainable, because it has these properties, or if we're going to them individually and say, we need a program for uh, farm products because the farmers uh, need this economic benefit, it, it doesn't get us anywhere, or it's difficult because, you know, the, the, the congressman says, okay, let me get this. There's good biodiesel, there's bad biodiesel, and which is which, and I can't keep this straight. I don't want to piss anybody off. I don't have time for this. I'm going to go talk to these natural gas guys because they've got their, they got their standby down the path. They've, they're plentiful, they're clean, and then they've got money to spend to tell everybody how great they are. So, so we, we are a small industry. We have to stay united, and we've been enormously successful in that, in, in going forward and developing policies that support uh, the entire industry. And we also have, besides just public policy, we have to have a critical mass to, to maintain momentum on technical issues. And, and this, I took like 30 seconds to make this list of just some of the technical issues that, if we drop the ball, would kill the biodiesel industry. Like I said, it doesn't include everything, doesn't include any of the policies. Just some of the things, OEM support, underground storage tanks, you know, Clean Air, Clean Air Act compliance, things that that we need resources to go out and test or convince other people to spend their money to test so that we can prove scientifically that, that we are <coughs> fuel. And this is the <coughs> things that, that the National Biodiesel Board takes on. Uh, our staff work with our, with, work with our members uh, to develop data and, and things like this. And, and most of these are not funded by our membership dues. Our, our membership dues go mostly to support the public policy aspects. All of our technical projects, like, like my position, is, is funded by uh, public funds either from some of the state feedstock associations or from USDA or DOE type grants. So we have to go out and get public funds. We <coughs> leverage our, our membership um, contributions by going out and getting public funds to do this kind of research. And this is the stuff that really requires unity among the, among the industry. And so just taking that one example for uh, our work with engine manufacturers, because I know, you know, some of you may be able to survive without a federal removal fuel standard. You know, you may have access to a certain amount of feedstock and you may have customers that know your business and are going to buy from you no matter what. But if they can't buy vehicles that will work on biodiesel, we're all out of luck. So there's just one example of our work with the engine manufacturers. And I talked a little bit about development of the ASTM specifications. Um, you know, that's been key to make sure we have a good reputation with consumers. It's also been key just to identify the fuel so that engine manufacturers know what to design for and how to test. You know, 2007 and 2010 were crossroads for engine manufacturers. Um, emission standards got a lot more stringent. Diesel vehicles are cleaner than ever, but they also have some complicated emissions technology to make that happen. So it was crossroads for the industry because before 
you know, biodiesel, you know, work, worked in the biodiesel engines that, that we had some B5 support, some B20 support from different companies. Uh, but in 2007, when they added diesel particulate filters and other emissions technology, it really became critical whether the biodiesel was going to work with those systems or not. And they were under federal mandate from EPA to make sure they worked. 2009, 2010, there was some question whether the biodiesel industry was dead, whether we were going to be around. And so a lot of the engine manufacturers, you know, they were like, you know, I, I don't think this biodiesel is going to stick around. Let's not spend our own money doing research. Let's just, let's just forget about biodiesel. We had to go to them and say, we are a real play, player. We're going to make a billion gallons in 2011. We're going to make two and a half billion gallons in 2015. We're going to be in 5% of the diesel pool. We're sustainable. You need to build cars to allow biodiesel. But isn't, I mean, doesn't Europe have that? I mean, <coughs> doesn't Europe put that money into those pressure on those guys? Not as good as we do. And, and I, I'll get to that a little bit. Because we've, I, I know a lot, of, a lot of people in the room are B100 supporters and want, want as much biodiesel as possible. The National Biodiesel Board is, has focused all of our technical resources on B20 <coughs> and lower pollution. So 2012 was, was a, a big year. We had 10 new engine manufacturers come out and support come out and support B20 or higher blends. So that's now 77% of U.S. manufacturers approved B20. Is that 77% by a list or by cars on the road? I think it's by a list. And you don't have so Volkswagen, or Mercedes, or Audi, or BMW supporting B20. That's our yeah. That's our customer base. Yeah. I mean, Sorry to jump ahead, but you, yeah, is there any movement? I get that. Um, um, if you look at, if you cut out those light duty vehicles, the, the Mercedes, the, the Volkswagens, if you look just at medium heavy duty trucks, we've got 95% of, of that market supporting V20 now. So we're making great progress there. And, and by the way, we never ask anybody to take our word. We, we kind of uh, pool the OEM statements on our webpage. So if you go to biodiesel.org, you can find statements directly from those OEMs and what they're currently supporting. There's just some of the logos of the companies that do support B20 or higher. Hmm. I've got, we've got two pages of this now. These are all the new companies that are added just this year that now support uh, B20. So we've seen a lot of positive movement there. And again, that's because we've been united in saying that we are a serious industry. We've got tons of producers all around the country, big and small, using lots of different feedstocks. So sell some vehicles that, that will burn, burn our fuel. As Jason mentioned, um, the trouble spots really are in the light duty. Which are, you know, the, the, most of the light duty passenger cars in the U.S. Are, are German, and most of them are currently not supporting B20. What about the passenger vehicle that's coming out in 2013? I think it's a Chevy or a Chevy Cruze. Yeah, Chevy Cruze. So no official announcement on that. We're, we're optimistic. And the issue, going back to your question about Europe, is Europe hasn't been aggressive on B20 higher blends. You know, their renewable energy directives average out to like a B7 blend. So all these German manufacturers are kind of dragging their feet on B20 because they're like, well, we don't, we don't have to do that in Europe. And we're in a position where even if, even if we convince them to do the research and they do it and they find out that their Volkswagens, for instance, would run on B20, they're not real interested in saying that because then they would have to say that in Europe. They're not being pressured in Europe the same way we're pressuring them. So it's kind of an odd situation. Um, <clears throat> looking at this list, I mean, you see basically all the, you know, medium and heavy duty vehicles, you know, can run B20 and the light duty can't. Um, you know, that's interesting. My understanding is that, you know, heavy duty vehicles don't have the same emission requirements that light duty vehicles do. A lot of passenger cars, they thought they were more stringent. So it's, I mean, are those heavy duty vehicles even using the particulate filters? That, yeah, as, yeah, yeah, as, of, as of 2010, all the heavy duty vehicles are, have to be compliant. Okay. So, that, so they're clean, but they do have, they do have some different ways of, of going about it. Okay. Right? So. Um, and, it and it comes down to the, the post injection, like, like Jason mentioned. So a lot of these light duty cars, they currently have a slightly less rigorous emissions control system. They, I think they understand that now. I think they they could upgrade that if, if pressure, or it may come it may come down to that their concerns are not are not really uh, as much to be worried about as they think they are. So it's yeah. So it's not necessarily a technical problem. It's just maybe a question of motivation. <coughs> it's a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Is there bean counter saying do we want a warranty B20 yeah. or just not worry about it? And say you know we go to B5. If 
you go over that, it's on your own. And that's really the bean counters, yeah. liability, and lawyers. And there is a solution there. So if we continue to pressure them, there is a solution there, and it is affordable. I mean, if you consider a Mercedes automobile affordable, <laughs> making it compatible with biodiesel is definitely affordable. So if they're compatible with B7 in Europe, why, why aren't they B5 here? Uh, just because we have the B5 specification well, and they are they are B five because they're D nine and seven five, so therefore by, by the default use, they are. If the pump labeling breaks at B five. It's B five and lower doesn't have to be labeled. Right. If it's between B six and B twenty, has one label. So a, a B seven pump is could be a B twenty pump. You have no way of knowing. Um, the only heavy duty truck on there, Peterbilt Kenworth. I personally, I'm not too worried about them because they don't build their own engines. They use Cummins or Caterpillar or Detroit Diesel that are already on our new 20 list. So I think it's just a matter of time before them fully coming around. Um, but it's what we do is we keep the pressure on. Keep it up. Keep it up. Can I ask something real quick on Volkswagen? I've read several articles saying that they're moving towards uh, warranting 20% renewable diesel, getting away from buying diesel entirely. Renewable diesel meets the D975 specification. Uh, so you could use B. You could use renewable yeah. diesel 100. Which well, that's that's what they think. Our criticism of the whole renewable diesel thing is they have gone out there and said, hey, you know, you don't have to worry about biodiesel. That's that biodegradable stuff is going to gel up. Just use renewable diesel and you won't have any problems. Well, the fact is, they actually don't have a spec for renewable diesel. And do they need one if it meets D975? It doesn't meet D975. They don't have a specification to say what the renewable diesel is. They don't have a specification to say what's allowed and what's not. You could you could label straight vegetable oil as renewable diesel, and nobody can say that that's My not renewable diesel because there's no official definition. Yeah. Hmm. So maybe like non-coprocessed or coprocessed, maybe? Either way, there is, there's no ASTM definition of renewable diesel. It, it probably no meets the specification, but is not legally described as. Well, and, so and you might find it's not legally to be sold in a state like California. The DMS regulates and says everything will be 975. I mean, so if there's not a standard that it meets or the exemption is for biodiesel. So the company can sell, sell you renewable diesel will say that their product meets D975, which may be true. Okay. But you have no way of knowing the next company that comes along and wants to sell you who knows came out of their black box. And no idea of knowing what that is or how to define it or how to test for it. And often the manufacturers are invested in these these other things. Like Volkswagen invested in, uh, I believe, a renewable diesel, but it's called Sun Diesel. Yeah. Yeah. And it has no description as to what it is at all. Yeah. So I've been actually holding off on asking a question about renewable diesel because I wanted to let you get through all your, your slides, but since the discussion came up. So um, outside of the, the spectrum, of the, the political spectrum, the regulatory spectrum, just taking it from a purely biochemical you know, perspective compared to biodiesel as a fuel and using the same feedstocks, how is the MBB, is it, what is the reasoning, if it's just completely from a logical perspective, what is the reasoning that renewable diesel, if it could be produced as economically, small scale, be produced from the same products, that renewable diesel would be taken on as a technology, as a renewable fuel, and be promoted as such? Um, other than the fact that it just isn't biodiesel. Well, and the sticking point right now actually is at that ASTM specification level. It's like, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just from the biochemical perspective, just from the fact that it could be a better fuel. It meant to drop in fuel for any engine that currently is on the market if it was specified as such. You, know, you can make exactly what you're looking for, a hydrogenated alkane. Other than the fact that it's not biodiesel, what's the problem with renewable diesel? Well, I don't, you know, I Put it that way, I don't know that there there is one, but we have we have said that if if our organization is going to uh, increase in size and scope and bring in things that aren't methyl esters that don't meet D sixty seven fifty one, we have to define what it is. Right, right now, that 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 D sixty seven fifty one is very critical to defining who we are. So, if we're going to bring in renewable diesel, we need a specification for it too. So we'll be D sixty seven fifty one plus whatever that specification is, and it doesn't exist yet. Um, it might be a sustainability transition, but it might be an imperative to survive all this on. Yeah, from a sustainability much. perspective, my concern is, and I, and I think something may come along someday and make renewable diesel more efficient, but from a sustainability perspective, I see that the, the yield is not as good. I see the biodiesel is more efficient. You can 
you can produce fuel at a lower temperature, lower pressure. You don't have as much energy <coughs> intensity in, in the conversion process. What about all the methanol or the uh, the, the, the base in acid yeah, that's not right. required? And then the fact that the fuel doesn't have a, an ester. What do you say? I'm so I'm, I'm so sorry. sorry, guys. We have to call it because oh, we have okay. lunch right after the next presentation. This is my last slide. There you go. And I, I'm a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah. Yeah. We have to call you. So if I look at you know why is biodiesel successful? This is why. This is the thing that's going to get us to that five percent goal. And the other problems that society has, I think, could also follow these. This example, yeah. by, we produce real environmental benefits. We increase energy security. We support jobs and economic benefits. You know, we have a commitment to fuel quality and performance. We have a commitment to doing outreach and education. And we do responsible goal setting and saying this is how big we can be, and that's the right size for this industry. And we wouldn't be there without successful public policy. And all of that hinges on emphasis on science, quantified analysis, and, and tackling challenges head on. So I'm, I'm proud of every one of you for actually being out there on the ground and, and tackling these challenges. It's a privilege to work for you. And I say um, keep up the good work.